David Letterman knew his life would never be the same after his 2009 scandal, comparing it to having killed your family in a car crash. Many think that the host did not do enough atoning to those he affected with the toxic environment he created at his workplace. In today's video, we're diving into the story head first. On October 1, 2009, David Letterman returned from a commercial break on The Late Show and asked his audience if he could tell them a story. A few weeks earlier, he explained, he'd gotten into his car early in the morning and found a mysterious package sitting in the back seat. The package contained a note that told David that his secrets were no longer that. There's a, a letter uh, in the package and it's, uh, it says that uh, uh, I know that you do some terrible, terrible things. <laughs> And I can prove that you do these terrible things. And, and sure enough, contained in the package was stuff to prove that I do terrible things. The audience chuckled uncomfortably. At first, David carefully omitted the terrible things, chronicling what happened next and leaving out the most crucial information. Letterman told the audience that he immediately called his lawyer. Whoever had left him the package wanted $2 million to keep quiet. He and his lawyer contacted the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which informed them that the threat constituted blackmail. It was the work of Robert Joe Halderman. The producer had been dating Stephanie Burkett, a woman who worked as Letterman's assistant on his late night talk show. Apparently, Halderman had stumbled upon a diary of Burkett's and the woman had written down all the details concerning her affair with her boss. He was furious at first. However, Stephanie convinced him she would end things with David. She didn't. Having uncovered proof that Letterman was getting sexually involved with women he had worked with on his show, Halderman made a decision he has come to regret. Robert had been swimming in alimony debts from three marriages, so he decided he would extort Letterman. His method was quite something. He threatened to write a screenplay centered on Letterman's workplace infidelity and how it determined who progressed and who didn't. Of course, the idea of it scared the living crap out of the TV host. The lawyer met with Letterman's extortionist a few times, including at least one rendezvous which, unknown to Robert, was recorded. Ultimately, the man was given a fake check for $2 million. On the afternoon of October 1st, a few hours before that day's late show taping, the blackmailer was arrested. The audience laughed and applauded throughout Letterman's monologue, which he sprayed with jokes and descriptions of how terrified he was about the ordeal. The whole thing must have felt a little like a stand-up routine. In the end, having sufficiently positioned himself as the victim, Letterman finally revealed what terrible, terrible things his blackmailer knew about him. He stated that he had been sexually involved with women who worked for him on the show. He paused. The studio was silent. I have uh, had sex with women who work for me on this show. After the reveal, he joked about how it would be perhaps more embarrassing for the women than it was for him. It's possible he didn't view himself as a catch but who knows exactly what he meant by that. That's about all Letterman said on the matter. He cut to commercial break moments later and brought out Woody Harrelson when he returned. Following his revelation, news of his many extramarital affairs surfaced on the internet. His preemptive move, though, countered most of the effects. Some even praised him for coming clean rather than doing all he could to sweep things under the rug. His wife, Regina Lasko, was not as forgiving. The two met when she was a production staffer on Late Night with David Letterman. It's worth noting that when they started dating, he was already in a relationship with Meryl Marco, his former head writer. Regina and David had only been married six months when news of the scandal broke, and though they shared a kid and had been together for decades before the wedding, he feared she would pack her bags and leave. She did not, but her forgiveness did not come easily. How did you regain her trust? That's what I'm still doing. I'm still doing it each and every day in big ways and small ways and, and get the reward of, of uh, the nature of a relationship I never experienced before in my life, nor did I ever think was possible. Along with Letterman's family, some of his staffers were largely unaware that the host had a series of affairs with his employees. Some suspected as much, and a few said they knew what Letterman was doing, wrote Jason Zinneman, a New York Times reporter. There had been rumors among some on staff about Letterman's flirtations for years. The Monday after he confessed, Letterman spoke again about his infidelities on air, apologizing to his staff and wife. 
She has been horribly hurt by my behavior. And when something happens like that, if you hurt a person and it's your responsibility, you try to fix it, Letterman said. Either you're going to make some progress and get it fixed, or you're going to fall short and perhaps not get it fixed. So let me tell you folks, I got my work cut out for me. After confessing, Letterman held a meeting with his staffers to cope with and avoid his personal life, according to Zinneman. I was looking for a refuge. Whether they knew it or not, my staffers were being used to support me, David said. The show was endlessly helpful. Since then, I have tried to acknowledge that mistake and be a better person. At the time, the pain that I caused myself was the fear that I had blown up my family. It's as scared as I've ever been in my life. The TV host later opened up about spiraling into a depression. Letterman was frank about getting through the scandal as he and writer Steve Young reviewed the monologue that would address the affairs on air. I'm in hell. I will always be in hell until the day after, when I will go to hell, the late show host told Young at the time. The response to Letterman's confession was a big, collective shrug. On The View, Barbara Walters praised him for coming clean and getting out in front of the story called him a very attractive man and emphasized that he hadn't been accused of sexual harassment. Writing for the New York Times, Maureen David dismissed the notion that Letterman's behavior constituted anything too untoward, explaining that the women who got involved with Letterman were not pressured. Stephanie Burkett's star rose quickly at The Late Show. After being promoted to his assistant, she became a regular on-air talent, making over 250 appearances on camera. According to an article in New York Magazine that cited staffers who worked on the show during Burkett's tenure, her relationship with Letterman was essentially an open secret. How might other female staffers who weren't sleeping with Letterman have felt seeing Burkett's career take off so successfully? The host never explicitly revealed sex as a means for promotion, at least not that we know of. But that doesn't mean that, in showing special attention to an employee he had a relationship with, he didn't create an uncomfortable, toxic environment for other women who worked for him. According to Nell Scovell, who wrote for Late Night in the 1990s, that's exactly what he did. Writing for Vanity Fair in 2009, she said Letterman's affairs made working for him uncomfortable. So uncomfortable, in fact, that she ultimately walked away from her dream job. There's a subset of sexual harassment called sexual favoritism that, according to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, can lead to a hostile work environment, often creating an atmosphere that is demeaning to women, Scovell wrote. And that pretty much sums up my experience at Late Night with David Letterman. Even though Scovell's piece ran just weeks after Letterman's on-air admission, it never really gained traction. The apology, just to be clear, was I was not sexually harassed on that show. I do think I was a victim of a subset, which is called sexual favoritism, mm -hmm. which is when there are people having relationships and they're getting benefits sure. and uh, everybody suffers. At the time, the National Organization for Women was virtually the only entity to back her up, to agree that having sex with some staffers and then showing them preferential treatment in the workplace was wrong. As the boss, Letterman is responsible for setting the tone for his entire workplace, and he did that with sex, now wrote in a statement. In any work environment, this places all employees in an awkward, confusing, and demoralizing situation. Why wasn't that a more significant part of the conversation? How did so many commenters fail to see the problem with a powerful boss sleeping with his subordinates who, according to another employee, then enjoyed professional privileges? As Scovell said, that behavior was harmful. It was demeaning. Perhaps in 2009, people just didn't think it was a big deal. There's a concerning trend regarding sexual misconduct, whereby if a celebrity committed some impropriety long enough before the Harvey Weinstein revelations came to light, they seem to escape judgment, at least for a time. The era in which he admitted to sleeping with women who worked for him, allegedly creating a hostile workplace, happened long enough ago that people have mostly forgotten about it. While confusing and demoralizing for some of the women who worked for him, his affairs appeared to be entirely consensual. Letterman admitted that he had sex with his employees. He apologized to his wife. He never engaged with the idea that he might have made his show an unfair and difficult place for women to work where, intentionally or not, he signaled that having sex with the bosses was a way to get ahead. Letterman may not have ever pressured staffers into having sex with him, but that doesn't necessarily mean his behavior deserves the kind of all is forgiven it received. And he agrees. Uh, she has forgiven me. Have you forgiven you? No. No. I don't, I don't have that luxury. Mm. 
I have to figure out what I did, why I did it, and live with it. But I, ca I can't forgive that behavior. You know, I, I'm at, like I said, I'm at the top of the flow chart. It's, it's my fault. The host previously admitted to Rolling Stone that the scandal was the lowest point in his life. In 2015, he told the New York Times that it should have cost him his job. At the time, I was largely ignorant as to what really I had done. It just seemed like, okay, well, here's somebody who had an intimate relationship with somebody he shouldn't have had an intimate relationship with. And I always said, well, who hasn't to myself? As Letterman said back in 2009, if you hurt a person and it's your responsibility, you try to fix it. 13 years later, it's worth asking whether he ever really tried hard enough. Thank you for watching. Be well and be kind.